Right. Well, I just want to echo what Mike has just said uh, to Gail. That was a really beautiful talk and very, very moving about a really important um, place and a series of events. Um, uh, Gail spoke about the Pilgrims Weekend that we held um, in April 2019, uh, which was focused on Old Sarum um, and and based at uh, Martin Cell near Pusey. Um, it was a really lovely occasion and I gave a much smaller version of this talk on that on that Pilgrim's Weekend. I really encourage anyone to come on Pilgrim's Weekends because they're really good. So I've chosen to speak about um, Amesbury and its associated Mesolithic archaeological site of Blick Mead because Amesbury is less well known than its big brother Salisbury and yet it interconnects with one of the richest archeological landscapes in Britain. And I'd also like to show how recent discoveries point to the area's continuity of use over thousands of years. So in this picture, we can see an old photo of the town with the Abbey Church in the background and the hill known as Ves Vespasian's Camp uh, behind it, beyond which lie Salisbury Plain and Stonehenge. Oh. Um, Amesbury is a market town with a population of around 10,000 on the southern edge of Salisbury Plain, which just down here. Um, it's just off the A303, about nine miles north of Salisbury, and a mile and a, and a half east of Stonehenge, which is over here. The town sits in a fold of the beautiful river Avon. Now, actually, I guess you're all seeing these, these pictures here. I want to get rid of them. That's better. Um, the, the, um, there's a beautiful fold of the River Avon, which comes through, we'll see it more clearly later, but it swirls around here. Um, that is distinct, it's the Hampshire Avon, that's distinct from the several other English River Avons in this country, which would have been, this, and this would have been a communication route and is no doubt a factor in the town's location. The Hampshire Avon flows from its springs in the Vale of Pusey, south up at the top here, yeah, south past Amesbury and Stonehenge, when it is joined by numerous tributary rivers and brooks, which Gail has spoken about so well, before passing the ancient fortification of Old Sarum through Salisbury and eventually flowing out to the sea at Christchurch. Amesbury may not impress us with a great sense of the past today, yet this quiet Wiltshire town can trace a deep history of human activity and settlement going back to before the formation of the British Isles. Today, Amesbury acts as a potential stopping off point for thousands of visitors each year to the Stonehenge World Heritage Site. And it also serves the military camps that cluster around the Salisbury Plain since its use as a military training ground from the early 20th century. Amesbury was formerly called Ambrosbury, perhaps deriving its name from an ancient British chieftain, Ambrosius Aurelianus, fifth century Romano British general, who it was later claimed was the brother of Uther Pendragon. More prosaically, maybe the hill on its western side um, was owned by a man called Ambre, and its Saxon name would therefore be Ambrose Bar or Bury. The hill has a Celtic Iron Age hill fort fortification on it, which was strengthened and held as a camp by the Romans, hence its current name, Vespasian's camp, though the Emperor Vespasian never came to England, I believe. The Parliamentary Gazetteer of 1851 notes that here is said to have been an ancient British monastery for 300 monks founded by Ambrius and Abbot, or else by the famous Prince Ambrosius, who was therein buried. And it was destroyed by that cruel pagan Guthrum, who overran all this country in the 6th century. By the 10th century, Amesbury, Amesbury was a royal manor. It was important enough that the Witan, the Anglo-Saxon King's Parliament or Council of Eldermen, was held on occasion in Amesbury. Around the year 980, Elfrith or Ethelfrida, the Queen Dowager of King Edgar, built on this site a monastery for the nuns of the Benedictine Order. This followed the murder of her stepson, King Edward, and known as Edward the Martyr, at Corfe Castle, 
and it was long thought that Ailfrith was behind the murder to get her son Ethelred on the throne. So perhaps she built the abbey as a penance. In any case, she commended the monastery to the patronage of St. Mary and St. Melorius, a Cornish saint whose relics were preserved here. So this is the parish church of Amesbury, um, which is the last remaining part of the abbey and priory and monastery that had been there. In AD 1177, there was talk of scandal and the abbess and nuns were expelled for their ill lives. King Henry II then converted it into a cell of the great convent of Fort Evreux in Anjou, which was the burial place of the Plantagenet kings and queens. So the new abbey became the retreat of several royal and noble ladies, including Mary, daughter of Edward I, and Eleanor, queen of Henry III. By the time of Henry VIII, the abbey was one of the richest in England, but eventually the nunnery itself was surrendered at the dissolution in 1540. Oops. Here's a plan of the parish church that is still standing. The central tower um, allowed the top and side apses to be used as the abbey church, while the older Norman nave uh, apparently formed the parish church, but the rest of the abbey was destroyed. Eventually, a fine mansion was built on the site of the abbey and bears its name. This became the seat of the Duke of Queensbury and was rebuilt in the 1830s to create the current building, which is now a very exclusive care home. And it is a distinct challenge to gain access to its grounds, although Gatekeeper managed to get a, an actual private tour on our pilgrim's weekend. And the grounds are pleasantly laid out with an oriental lodge and the Avon flowing peacefully through. Yet concealed within this estate until recent years lay fascinating evidence of the site's long-standing connection to our remote ancestors. Since 2005, archeological digs have been conducted each year by a small team from the Open University and the University of Buckingham, at first on Vespasian's camp. This is an Iron Age hill fort on Vespasian's camp which overlooks Salisbury, well, it's a barrow on the hill fort, which overlooks Salisbury Plain and is intervisible with major prehistoric sites, including Stonehenge Avenue and Blue Stonehenge, as well as the River Avon. Here we can see how the site fits into the wider Stonehenge landscape. The River Avon flows from the top right, curling past the Great Henge of Durrington Walls and the smaller Woodhenge just below it for turning west between Amesbury and the A303, past Vespasian's camp through the Abbey grounds, and then meandering again before turning south to Salisbury. Where the river turns south at this point is the start of the avenue leading to Stonehenge. To the north can be seen the great Stonehenge Cursus, and the surrounding chalk downs are littered with causewayed camps, round barrows, long barrows, and many other archaeological features. Clearly, we are looking here at a vast and significant ceremonial landscape. The Cursus, Durrington Walls, and the early phases of Stonehenge are Neolithic earth structures dating from around 3,500 to 2,000 BC. Here is a view of part of the great Durrington Walls Henge, with the woods of Vespasian's camp, just visible at the top left-hand side. The Henge is vast. You can see its outlines here. And um, stretches under the modern road to the left, down to the Avon, out of the picture. And here's an impression of what this settlement might have looked like based on discovered archeology. span Although only a few Neolithic houses have been excavated, their density indicates that the site might have contained hundreds of homes, as well as the several elaborate wooden temple structures which have been excavated. One here, big circle, and another one there. The land, this, this image shows the setting of Durrington Walls with the river Haven to the east side. The land to the south of Durrington, which contained Woodhenge here, as well as other large timber structures no longer visible, and the so-called Cuckoo Stone to the west was also significant. It's now theorized that Durrington Walls and Woodhenge which showed evidence of feasting, a lot of feasting, 
were places for the living, while Stonehenge may have been a sacred place for the dead. And here is an impression of Woodhenge, showing how its rings of concentric wooden posts up to 25 feet high might have looked. It dates from about 2400 BC, a similar age to the Stonehenge bluestones. And on the right, the cuckoo stone, a naturally occurring sarsen stone, is a rarity on Salisbury Plain. It was placed upright by a Neolithic people and continued to be venerated until Roman times at least. There are cuckoo or gauk stones across the British Isles. Gauk was the Anglo-Saxon for both cuckoo and fool, the latter being thought to be fairy touch. The call of the cuckoo was associated with spring and believed to beckon the souls of the dead, as the cuckoo was thought to be able to travel back and forth between the worlds of the living and the dead. So perhaps this is a place of transition between the worlds. Having said that, I, and at least one other person, think it looks more like a lioness than a cuckoo. A processional route runs, it's not shown here, but it runs from Darrington Walls down to the Avon. And it's thought that the dead may have been transported on boats down the Avon to the foot of the Stonehenge Avenue, where stood a small henge made of blue stones from the Preseli Mountains in Wales, known as Bluestone Henge. From there, such a procession could have followed the avenue to Stonehenge itself. And here is a digital reconstruction of Blue Stonehenge from the Stonehenge Riverside project. The stones are no longer present and could possibly have been repurposed in the Blue Stone Circle in Stonehenge itself. By 2500 BC, our ancestors were building with stone. There was still moving earth as many barrows and nearby avenue leading from Amesbury demonstrate. But over several hundred years, they began to construct the Stonehenge we know with the addition of the blue stones from Preseli and later Sarsens from the Marlborough Towns. Recent research tells us that the Sarsens were probably brought from West Woods, very close to Avery. However, until recently, the only evidence of pre-Neolithic activity in the area were the four enigmatic Mesolithic post holes in pits found in the old Stonehenge car park, dated to about 8,000 BC. But at Vespasian's camp, although the original focus was on the hill fort, attention soon moved to a chalk bed spring in the hollow between the hill and the Avon, known as Blick Mead, and shown here in blue at the top right. Blick Mead was assumed to be an 18th century water feature. An investigation revealed it to be part of a network of ancient chalkland springs with a constant temperature of around 11 degrees C so that it never freezes. This spring feeds the Avon, like the beautiful springs at Alton Priors in the Vale of Pusey. And a rare algae called Hildenbrandia is found in the spring and causes stones taken from it to turn bright red on exposure to air in a matter of hours. This discovery was in fact made by one of our own, our own dear Julia Cleave, whose son Tom worked on the dig. And here is Julia. It's possible that this spring was an original attraction, bringing both uh, animals and the hunters to the area, both for its life-giving source of fresh water and for the humans, possibly for the color-changing stones giving the place a magical significance. Here is a trench of the Blickmead excavations. Buried in the strata below the chalk layer you can see was layer after layer of archaeology, showing human habitation and use from around 8,000 BC until 4,000 BC, a span of 4,000 years during the Mesolithic or Middle Stone Age period. There were thousands of flints and burnt bones showing the site was used for feasting, whether continuously or returning regularly each year. Up to 1,600 flints per square meter were unearthed. This is a much higher concentration than the comparably important Star Car Mesolithic site in Yorkshire. And the flints showed a diverse range of tools, including this blade, which experts suggest could date from the very early Mesolithic or even late Upper Paleolithic or Old Stone Age. And here's a picture of David Jakes the, with the blonde hair, who runs the digs. Um, he's explaining the site to visitors here. As well as the flints, burnt and butchered bones of a wide range of species were found, including the largest UK concentration 
of aurochs, the now extinct car-sized wild cattle that roamed the plains at the time. David Jakes has said, I'm not sure entirely seriously, but he said, it would appear that thousands of years ago, people were eating a Heston Blumenthal style menu on this site, consisting of toad's legs, aurochs, wild boar and red deer with hazelnuts for Maine, another course of salmon and trout and finishing off with blackberries. The last aurochs died out in the 1620s in Poland, but their genes remain in some modern cattle species. Here is an example of an Asian bull that might approximate the size and shape of these wonderful beasts. And here at Blickmead, in one of the trenches, are preserved aurochs footprints. Blickmead is truly a very special site. However, you will be aware of the recent decision by the Secretary of State for Transport to give the go-ahead to the planned A303 Stonehenge Tunnel against the advice of planners. While decongestion of the A303 is desirable, and there are arguments for not having a major road running past Stonehenge. The proposed three kilometer tunnel is considered by many archeologists and UNESCO to be too short. With its entrances, exits and other infrastructure falling within the five kilometer wide World Heritage Site, possibly causing great archeological damage and putting Stonehenge's World Heritage Site status at risk. Here we can see the proximity of the A303 to Blickmead. It's really close. As part of the new plans, this section of the road will be elevated to carry traffic across the nearby Countess Roundabout, and the tunnel entrances and exits are both within highly significant archaeological zones. There's concern that the construction works will affect the water table in and around Blickmead, which is why Highways England have drilled boreholes only tragically, they drilled this one right through the aurochs footprints. And all this, in spite of the recent discovery by the Stonehenge Hidden Landscapes Project, of a vast ring of Neolithic shafts centred on Durrington walls. Each shaft is up to 30 feet across and 15 feet deep. They are four and a half thousand years old and span a two kilometre diameter, creating the largest known prehistoric structure in Britain. No one yet knows what this vast structure signifies, though it could have been a boundary guiding people to the sacred places of Durrington and Woodhenge. What other great mysteries are yet to be discovered in this rich landscape? Returning to Amesbury, the grave of a man dating to around 2300 BC was discovered in the town. The excavation was in advance of housing development and his grave was the richest from this period ever found in Britain and contained the country's earliest gold objects. He was dubbed the Amesbury Archer. This isn't actually him, of course. His remains are on display at Salisbury Museum, but the Amesbury History Centre is also well worth a visit if you're in Amesbury, and it has a splendid collection of finds from Blick Mead. And finally, I thought it would be nice to end up with a picture of a druid, although they did not, of course, build any of the sites we have just seen. However, I am certain that they loved the land, and I hope that this talk has given a sense of the secrets and treasures hidden everywhere in the landscape, wherever we live, and even in apparently mundane locations. And that it is our duty and our pleasure to go out into the land, to connect with its spirit, with love, and to protect it where we can. Thank you.